Hey everyone, this is Nick and GNOME 43 is upon us. It should actually release today. And while it won't revolutionize the way you use your desktop, it brings a lot of usability improvements. Wait a minute, I see you in the back. GNOME was already super usable. If you were willing to adapt to its workflow, which admittedly is not for everyone. Still, GNOME 43 brings new quick settings, a much better file manager, a new device security panel, experimental extension support in GNOME Web, and good updates to the core apps. So it's well worth a nice little video tour. Just like our sponsor is well worth a look if you want to monitor and secure your internet connection. This video is sponsored by Safing. They make the Portmaster, which is an amazing tool that lets you control and monitor your internet connection with a simple graphical user interface. You get block lists, you get profiles depending on your current connection, and you can even tweak settings per app. It's also completely open source and free. Safing also makes the SPN or Safing Privacy Network. It's a powerful VPN alternative which spreads your connections across the globe instead of rerouting all your connections to only one server. With the SPN, you can be everywhere at once and no website can build a profile from your visits and your location. Of course, you also get all the benefits from a traditional VPN. If that's something you'd like to try, and if you want to help support Safing's open source work, you can subscribe to the SPN right now, or download the Portmaster by heading in the link in the description below. So let's begin with what you can expect from GNOME Shell. The biggest change is in the main shell menu. It always grouped most system features like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the sound and mic volume, performance profiles, and system functions but it's now been made a lot more efficient. The new quick toggles lets you enable or disable these features in one click. Just click on the pill-shaped button and Wi-Fi is enabled, Bluetooth is turned off, or you're enabling night light or airplane mode, or even a VPN if you have one configured. These little buttons also let you select various options. If you click the little arrow, you will expand the setting, letting you switch to another Wi-Fi network, change the power profile on your laptop, or even select the audio outputs and inputs straight from this menu. And it is a lot more efficient than just unraveling a little menu and then clicking on an item, opening the full system settings app, and then changing what you want. It is no doubt inspired by mobile interfaces or what Apple does on macOS, but it's a great move nonetheless. It's not yet perfect though, as for example, the Bluetooth toggle is pretty useless. Clicking it when no device is spared makes the toggle disappear, so you will need to go into the settings to turn it back on. You also can't handle currently paired devices from this quick toggle, and you can't access the full Bluetooth settings from it. I'm also sure extensions that added components to this menu will have to be rewritten to take advantage of the new one, but in the long run, it's a great move. Now it would also be nice to be able to move them around by drag and drop or to add and remove these icons from the tray to have them always visible. The other system functions are now moved to the top of the menu, like accessing the settings, locking the computer, or getting to the power options, like shutting down or rebooting. You also get the remaining battery life and a screenshot shortcut here. Now, next, in the apps grid, you now get some pagination arrows to let you move easily from one page to the other if you're not using a touchpad. These are currently broken for me at the time I'm recording this video, so one day before release, but I'm sure it will be fixed. Serves me right for trying to not procrastinate and make these videos in advance. The shell has also received some performance improvements, with many crashes and memory leaks being fixed and it will support high-resolution scroll wheels in Wayland. For example, if you have an MX Master S3, like me, you'll be far more precise when scrolling. The file manager has also received a lot of love, enough that some people might actually call it a real file manager now. First, it's now adaptive, which means it handles smaller window sizes a lot better. This will make it run well on phones, but it also means you'll be able to use it on regular desktops and laptops while using less screen space. The sidebar will hide on the left side of the screen and is available at the click of a button. The toolbar will also split to use space on the top and the bottom of the window. The list view also got a nice upgrade that not only looks a lot better, but also makes it a lot easier to select multiple files and folders. 
There's also some blank space between elements, so you can use the context menu inside the current directory, which is a nice little usability tweak, and it also lets you drag the mouse to select multiple files. Hovering over elements will also highlight them so you know what you're doing, but the tree view is still not there, having been pushed back to the next release. So if you liked to expand your folders in list view, you're going to lose some functionality here. Which is okay, because column view is much, much better. But Nautilus does not have column view. The properties dialog has also been revamped and looks a lot nicer, with pages to order the information more clearly instead of juggling with tabs. And you can set a file as executable immediately from the properties page without having to access the permissions tab. The recents folder that is pinned to the sidebar is also a bit more usable, with the ability to sort elements there, with all the sorting options you're used to. Name, type, size, last modified or first modified. The search UI in Nautilus also saw a nice revamp, with a filter icon replacing the drop-down arrow Nautilus used previously. All the filters you added will also appear as tags in the address bar, letting you quickly remove a filter if need be, and you can still search by file name or do a full text search through documents. This does not turn Nautilus into a file search powerhouse, but it's still better than what it once was. But in my opinion, it still lacks the ability to save these searches and pin them to the sidebar, or to add more complex searches like looking for a specific file extension, or maybe even adding operators like AND or OR. A bunch of other extra tools have been added by default as well. There's a new context menu option to open a directory in console, the new GNOME Terminal app. There's a new email option that replaces the previous extension, and that uses the proper email portal, so it will use the right mail client. Emblems also make their way back in Nautilus, being used to indicate symbolic links or read-only files, but you can't add your own emblems to files and folders though. GNOME 2 had this feature, bunch of lazy developers. No, but seriously, bring back the emblems, they were great. And colored folders, and color labels as well. On top of all of this, you can also middle click the next or previous button to open the resultant directory in a new tab. Thumbnails with transparency will display a checkerboard background. You can copy the content path to the clipboard from the context menu, or open the current directory in other apps from the same menu. And the tabs have a new look that, in my opinion, feels better than the previous one. It should make its way to all Libadvita apps as well. The main menu has been reorganized, but it also lost the ability to manually hide the sidebar. Basically, Nautilus, while being ported to GTK4 and Libadvita, gained a bunch of features. It's now a little bit more powerful, a little bit more usable, it retains its simple user interface, but the loss of the expandable tree view is kind of a big regression that I wish they had fixed before shipping it. GNOME 43 also adds a new settings page geared towards informing users about their device's security status. It's accessible from the privacy panel and it gives you some details about the status of your hardware and firmware. It will for example let you know if secure boot is turned on or off, whether your UEFI key is valid, if a TPM module is present or not, if firmware write protection is turned on or off, if platform debugging is enabled, and more. All of this is combined into a security level that will let you know whether your hardware is safe or not. And this level ranges from 0 to 3, 3 being the highest. Now, there are a few issues with this panel. On my Slimbook Pro X14, which is a laptop that ships with Linux out of the box, I got a security level of 0 because the UEFI platform key was indicated as being invalid, even with secure boot enabled. And this might make users think that Linux is not a secure operating system, because Windows, while it would have the exact same issues, does not report them as problems. Now, the developers have planned to let users change some of these settings directly from this panel in future releases, and all of this will be based on LVFS, the Linux vendor firmware system, but it will only work on devices that actually support this system, which is not all manufacturers. Still, I think it's a good feature to have, even if it's incomplete for now. Now let's move on to the applications updates. First is Calendar. It was always pretty bare bones, but now it's getting a new sidebar with a date picker and an agenda view, and it's responsive as well. 
So now you can have a much better view of what you have to do in the near future and you can jump to a specific date a lot more easily instead of navigating the month or weeks in the main view. App styling has also been revised so it works better with dark mode and you get a new pinch to zoom gesture to scale the main view so that you can see specific hour ranges more closely or have a more bird's eye view of your calendar. It works on touchpads only, of course, courtesy of GTK4 and LibAdvita. And I really love these kind of touchpad interactions. It makes using GNOME on the laptop extremely nice. And I wish more apps implemented stuff like that, like back and forward gestures with two fingers, for example. Next is Epiphany or GNOME Web, the GNOME's web browser. It now supports web extensions, so you can install Firefox and Chrome extensions inside it. All you have to do is download the XPI or CRX file and add them from Epiphany's extension menu. Note that this menu is still hidden for now, but you can make it visible using gsettings or dconf. Not all extensions will work because they don't support all APIs yet, but it's a solid first step. The main missing part is web request, which means most ad blockers or tracker blockers won't work. And this will require changes in WebKit GDK, so it might be a little while. Epiphany also got a view source option and has an updated PDF library, although it hasn't been ported to GDK4 and LibAdvita, so it won't look as good as other GNOME apps yet. I think that as extension support matures, it would be nice to have some kind of extensions portal where developers can actually upload their extensions and where users can install them in one click instead of having to download a file manually and dragging it and dropping it. But it's still a solid move and it might make Epiphany into a very usable daily browser, which it cannot be right now for me because YouTube problems and also lack of extension support. GNOME software also got some love with performance tweaks and improvements and a far better drop down to select the packaging format you want to install, now indicated by a big colored check mark. You'll also be able to see other apps made by the same developer as the one you're currently looking at, at the bottom of app pages. And I'm sure that people who hate Flatpak will also hate this change because it presents older packaging formats like RPMs or DEVs inside of a red pill and that color is usually associated with danger or problems. Now if you installed web apps using GNOME Web and if your distro has that support enabled, GNOME software can also manage them and let you install them straight from GNOME software. GNOME Contacts can also now import and export vCard contacts, which is nice because that's a pretty basic feature for a contacts app. And finally, a lot of applications also got the new LibAdvita about dialogue, including the disk usage analyzer, the text editor, the weather app, fonts, files, calendar, music, clocks, calculator, extensions, and a lot more. It's a small change that won't really transform your GNOME experience, but at least they look nice. And now we come to the two big missing things from GNOME 43. Now, they were never promised, but they're still missing. The main one is accent colors. Basically, all other desktop environments have it now, and some GNOME-based distros have implemented it on top of base GNOME, so it's a bit sad to not see it yet. I'm sure it has something to do with the GNOME devs wanting to implement it properly in LibAdvita and not as a hack like what other GNOME-based distros do, but it's still a problem. It's a feature people expect to have nowadays. Same goes with the recoloring API, which promises to bring at least color theming in LibAdvita. It can be done as demonstrated by Gradients, formerly Advita Manager, but it's not in base GNOME yet. So GNOME 43? is definitely a worthwhile update. If you didn't like GNOME before, this one won't sway you as it keeps the same simple workflow that I personally really love, but a lot of others don't. It brings some really nice improvements to the general usability, especially with the quick settings, and it has the foundations for more advanced stuff, like the device security feature or extension support in GNOME Web. But it still lacks a few expected features, especially accent colors. And then there's the migration to GTK4 and LibAdvita, which is progressing very, very nicely. With GNOME 43, basically all the default apps have moved to it, and so you finally have a coherent platform with applications resembling each other, working like each other, and some nice performance improvements thanks to GTK4 and hardware acceleration. 
That's exactly what the GNOME developers set out to do when they introduced it. And developers seem to really enjoy LibAdvita because most of the crucial GNOME apps have already moved to it. Now, if you don't like how Advita looks, since you still don't have the recoloring API or the accent colors, you're gonna have to work a little bit harder to theme that thing. Personally, I will absolutely update my Fedora 36 desktop to Fedora 37 to benefit from GNOME 43. And I will keep my fingers crossed to have the few extensions I use be compatible, like Night Theme Switcher or App Indicators. So if you're a GNOME user, check with your distro maintainer to know when they release GNOME 43 for you and which elements you can expect and which ones they will have changed or removed. What isn't getting removed from these videos though is this segue to today's sponsor. Tuxedo is a company that makes devices, computers, that run with Linux out of the box. They ship worldwide, they have a huge selection of keyboard layouts, and you can even ask them to engrave your own custom keyboard layout if you prefer, and they have a nice big range of devices, which covers basically every need and every price point. Whether you want a thin and light ultrabook, a NUC, a giant gaming tower, or a gaming laptop, or a workstation, mobile or not, they have it. And they can configure them to your heart's content with various options like CPUs, GPUs, even sometimes displays, SSD, RAM. You can even have your own logo engraved on the lid of your laptop. So if you need a new device and you want to support Linux's development, and you also want to make sure that your computer runs Linux perfectly out of the box, then go to Tuxedo's website, clicking the link in the description below, and you get yourself a new device. They're really good. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, there's also the dislike button and the comment section to let me know what you think I said was wrong or terrible or completely out of line. And if you want to help support the channel, there's a super thanks button underneath this video, there's a PayPal link in the description, or you can join my Patreon subscribers or YouTube members. Both get access to a weekly podcast on Monday and I ask them to vote on the next topics that I'll cover for next month. Both links are in the description as well. So thanks everyone for watching the video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye!